Facebook. Setting it up. It says we're streaming. Great. Let's just assume that the video looks pretty good too. So guys, here we are. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do one last check to make sure it's showing up where I want it to show up. Go down here, check these videos. It says live. Great. I can close that and I can just be here with y'all. So everyone, thanks for if you jumped on and then jumped off. I just realized I want to be able to see um, the people that are <laughs> that are watching with us because I don't get to see that unless I log in here. So I go here. I load it up. I go to that thing that says live video. Then I click this and then I got to mute it because otherwise the whole world explodes. There we go. Okay, great. Hello, David. Hello, whoever else is watching. Whew. You know, sometimes, sometimes it just goes the way she goes. And this was one of those times. I, I have two Macs. This is the, this is the work Mac right here. It's got this lovely wooden shell on it with a dongle. Do you guys dongle? I dongle regularly. Anyhow, um, this is the work Mac. This one stays in my office. And then I've got another one that goes around. And this guy has been getting slower and slower. And so I think it's time to reinstall the operating system to pull everything off, basically format it, start fresh, and then build it back up. And I've been kind of delaying doing that because it's a fairly lengthy process because you have to scrape every you format. So you got nothing. And it's not like I'm reloading from a backup because the backup will have everything on it that was there when it was sluggish. And so it's not that I have to remember everything, but there's a little more of a lengthy process. And so, um, hey, Carrie, haven't seen you for a while. And so I think that that's the universe telling me, hey, it's time for you to do this. I've been kind of delaying it a little bit. And instead of doing that work and making it happen, I've just been getting really frustrated when things are slow. I mean, like, ah, oh, stupid Mac, you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, so that'll be kind of, that'll be a weekend project. I've already sipped the tea. I know that it's a big, I've, I've read in communities on Reddit on, I've not read any of this. It's just fun for me to make this up. I've read on the internet on Quora, people are like, oh, the best part of those tea times is when he takes that live sip of the tea and you know that it's live because he just poured it. I couldn't hang in there, guys. I, I broke because I was working through these technical problems. So I want you to know this is live tea. I haven't, I'm not putting in the tea, you know, with CGI after the fact, but you're going to have to trust me on this time. You won't get to see me pour it. So, ooh, that's what the doctor ordered. That's the tea, the tea sort of goodness that I required. So, let's see. New. Um, so it's been kind of a cool week. Um, the week before last, I was sharing that I was playing Ghost of Tsushima, mostly to the exclusion of everything else. It's kind of the nature of um, if you're someone who has the quality of passion as part of who you are, you've probably you might notice this about yourself. We don't those of us with passion don't. Um, I don't tend to have like a lot of gradient when it comes to me being into something. I fucking love it. And then I'm bored with it. It's all or nothing. My throttle goes all the way forward and then it comes all the way back. And so uh, that's okay. It's just, it, you know, it's a practice. It's not the default for me is not to have like the ability to moderate. And sometimes I really don't want to moderate. And so last week was kind of that theme was like, I got this new video game and I was like, this is amazing. And I leaned into that and trusted it. I checked to see, is there anything I need to manage or make sure is going to get handled if I really lean into this. Does Bay need anything from me? And then once that was acceptable, I was like, all right, let's do it. Party on. Throttle forward. And so throttle forward we did. And, uh, and it's a little edgy for me because I always worry like, oh, boy, am I just going to stop wanting to work ever? Um, that's always a bit of a concern. And on the tail of that, this week, I found, okay, kind of got my fill of that game. Good game. Highly recommended it. Highly recommend it. And now I'm done with it. I've won it. I've defeated it. I've freed at Tsushima. And, um, and so I'm kind of drawn back into work a little bit more. And I don't even know if I'd call it work, but just what I want to create in the world, the expression of my art this way. So there's two things I'll speak to. The first is I want to talk a little bit about the course that I'm putting together. Um, 
So I've had in my mind, maybe for as long as a year, this idea of putting together some kind of course. And the vision for the course is not like the, the what for for me is not ooh residual evergreen income. I could care less about that. I have zero concerns about um, generating something that just keeps creating income and, and then I can retire or, you know, I, whatever. That's, that's not really, it's not a motivator for me. Um, what does motivate me is the opportunity and the possibility for people to get to get the benefit of some of, of working with me, but at a lower level of commitment, because I recognize that a one-on-one -on -one level, it's a very high commitment I work with. And even the forge is, um, it's an $8,000 investment and that's not nothing. That's not, um, it's not free. And for some, some people are like, yeah, that feels like the right thing and I'm, I'm ready for it. And other people, they're not. And um, I, I want to, I always want to find ways, how can I serve people more? And I really believe that what serves people the most is to support them in making a commitment to themselves. Once we've made a commitment to ourselves, that's when the rubber really hits the pavement. That's when transformation can really start to take hold. And so whilst on the one hand, I'm really a yes to one-off conversations with people. If someone reaches out to me and says, hey, could I get a coaching conversation with you, just a one-off, I'm almost always going to be a yes to that person. But I also know that that alone is not going to really fully move the needle. And so I'm always looking like, what are some ways I can meet people where they are rather than kind of stand over here in the whatever color the tower of coaching is, the ivory tower, I guess, of coaching and be like, you got to commit it. I just can't do that. How do I meet them there? And so that's where I've been looking with this course. What would feel good for me? What's a lower level of commitment, but still calls them forward to make some kind of commitment to themselves? And how do we, um, how do I do that in a way that's going to really create the value I'm committed to creating? There's a million courses out there that you can take. And, you know, the statistics for dropouts on those is something like 90%. 90% of people don't follow through with them. They tend to do a lot of lecturing. And you watch these videos that are kind of stolid, kind of stodgy. And then, um, and then you don't really get anywhere at the end of it. And so the starting point for me is how do I create a low commitment offering for people and create the value that I'm really committed to creating? And I've had... I guess you could say a bit of a stick up my ass about that second one. I've really been kind of insistent that you can't with a course. And anytime someone would say like, hey, have you ever thought about doing this? Or maybe you could, I'd love to sort of do something along these lines. I've kind of been a hard no, that's just not going to work. And here's why. So I've been working myself out around that, bringing that to my coach, um, taking a look at that. What's my relationship to this? What's the story that's kind of running everything for me? And, and how do I create something different? So where we're where i'm kind of been creating this week is building out what will be ultimately a 10-week course it's a thousand dollar commitment and really the focus is entirely going to be on um the work of enrolling people in your practice this is a big thing for coaches but it's really a big thing for anyone that's in a service-based profession possibly a, a, a uh, what would the other one be a product based profession too but i noticed service-based it's a much bigger deal and and i think there's um, that work, people would call it selling, but like really enrolling people in what you're providing and having them see the, the possibility available in their life if they were to say yes to that. I think that can be a really beautiful thing. And I noticed that there's this huge part of the market serving coaches and other people, helping them not have to be with that thing. And what that does is it denies them both the breakthroughs and the opportunity that's available. If instead of avoiding this, they were to go into it and create whatever breakthrough would then have them love that and have that be every bit as delightful and fun and enriching and value filled as all of the other parts. So that's one of the things that's been there for me this week. I've been putting a lot of time into that and, uh, Turns out I got a lot to say as I, as I started to sit down and write these things out, I was like, Oh, wow, there's, there's tons of stuff here that I can provide. And um, I'm really excited about what's getting created there. Uh, second thing um, that I've been present to is just this notion of our, our relationship to whatever, to anything. How do we relate to any particular thing in our 
in our field of life, in our ongoing daily circumstances. And so I wrote just the other day about our relationship to commitment. Um, I was speaking to, I was leading a call for the, the Bureau of Veterans Affairs. So that's the, I guess, the branch of government in the States that um, works with veterans after they've kind of finished their military service. And we were looking at their relationship to accountability. And if you're curious, if you want to kind of dig into that and discover what your relationship to something is, and we could say with accountability, you can just write these questions down for yourself and answer them. So it'd be accountability is, and then you can, whatever answers you have for that. Next would be holding people accountable is, write out whatever you got for that. And then finally, being held accountable is. And um, the thing that is fascinating when you do this with a group of people and then get them to share is everyone has a different relationship to it. So we were looking really specifically at when people don't do what I tell them to do. I make that mean. So this is a function of our relationship to it, right? When people don't do what I tell them to do, I make it mean they don't respect me. When people don't do what I tell them to do, I make it mean they're lazy. When people don't do what I tell them to do, I make it mean they think they're a rebel and that the rebel and that the rules don't apply to them. And so the thing that's really fascinating is before we even get to the conversation with them, you know, like let's say you're a supervisor and you need to have someone take something on and you're like, oh, they haven't done the thing that they said they're going to do. There's a conversation to have all of your personal story, all of your relationship about not doing what you said you were going to do or about accounting is all of that is in the field. That's going to be this big thing that before you even get into conversation with, it's in your space, right? So if I have this story that not doing what you said you're going to do means you're lazy, I'm going to come to this person and I'm going to have a conversation with them. And I'm going to be listening through the lens of this person's lazy. So how is what they're telling me evidence that they're lazy? Where in what they're sharing, is there the place for me to help fix them, not be so lazy? And I'm going to be listening sort of to look for like, okay, what are the opportunities to help them practice not being lazy other places in their life, right? I'm, maybe even I'm thinking from like a really helpful, kind sort of place, but it's still totally colored by my relationship to what, what it means when people don't do what they say they're going to do. And so for the most part, we're completely unaware of this. We're not aware of our relationship to anything at all like that. Instead, we just operate on top of it. We're kind of like a victim to it. We're a victim to it because we can't see it. It's invisible to us. And anything that impacts how we show up in the world and we cannot see, we have no capacity to do anything about. And so what ends up happening in life is that we build these relationships about things like commitment. We can talk about our relationship to commitment. Commitment, commitment means that you lose your options. I'm just making some stuff up here, but this might be one person's relationship. Commitment means you lose options. Commitment means you're boring. Commitment means you're trapped. Commitment means you're rigid. Commitment means you cannot be spontaneous and have excitement. So that could be one person's relationship to commitment. And then what they're going to do is build a life that is a function of managing that relationship. So they're predictably going to avoid getting into commitments. Or when they do get into commitments, they're going to be looking for how this commitment shuts down their options. They're going to be gathering the evidence that supports that view. They're going to be finding reasons that this commitment traps them and how it doesn't let them have everything that they want. And because we can see evidence to support whatever lens we have, kind of like the grass is always greener on the other side, we're always going to be able to prove whatever belief we're currently in, and we're going to create the reality of that belief. And so then where people finally end up is they create lives that are rooted in avoiding that thing they have a disempowered relationship to. It's kind of like, it's not conscious, but the way the, the calculus goes is given that Commitment is rigid, boring, traps you, makes you boring and takes away your spontaneity. And I don't want to be trapped, boring, rigid, without spontaneity, blah, 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 blah. How do I get what I want without having to commit? And we create more and more contrived ways of avoiding this thing called commitment or called whatever your disempowered relationship is about. And 
that is what we think of as like, oh, I've created this change. Life is going to be different now. And instead, all we're doing is getting better at avoiding, at contracting from life. And the real work is to go into that relationship, to start to bring that relationship up out of the water so we can really get a look at it and start to dismantle our relationship to commitment or to whatever it is and build a new relationship to it. The cool thing about all of this is our relationship to something is made up. We came by it honestly. We were trained in this by our parents who were trained in it by their parents who were trained in it by their parents. But there's no objective reality. There's no truth in the world that commitment is the way your story says it is. There's no objective truth that everyone that has a lot of money is greedy or is kind or is whatever you fill that blank in with. And so if at some point it was something created rather than objectively true, beautiful thing is you can start to take that on and you can pull that apart and you can create a new relationship to it. And that's where our breakthroughs lie. That really opens us up to start to be able to create something different and not try to create a life by avoiding something, but be able to be with, to empower more of life as life shows up. Okay. Who do we have watching? I see you, David. I see four eyeballs there. Put, just drop your name in, in the comments uh, if you can. It's kind of fun to see you. You need to see someone's name show up there. Um, I'm posting this late and through the, the Adam Quiney page. So sometimes we have less viewers as a result, but that's fine. That's all good. Uh, I want to tell you briefly about who Ernest is, and then we'll bring him on. So Ernest and I initially got put in touch with uh, a mutual friend of ours named Allison Garner. Um, Allison is a member of our leadership team for the intensive and, um, and is a participant this year in the forge. And uh, we love Allison. And she said, Hey, you should talk to Ernest. He's Canadian. <laughs> You're from Canada. You must know people in Canada and uh, coaching. And, and I think he's even thinking of moving to Victoria. And so Ernest and I talked a little bit, got on the phone and shared our stories. And then, um, uh, hey, Leo. And then I was sitting, having a beer with Bay on the patio uh, overlooking the ocean last Friday. And this man came up and said, hey, yeah, I thought I recognized that man bun. And turns out it was Ernest. He just moved about a week ago or two weeks ago here to Victoria. So a neat time. And he was like, yeah, I think we're actually going to uh, to be talking next Friday. So cool, right? Serendipity. So Ernest, let's get your get your camera on, get your mic on. Let's get you on here then I don't have to talk as much. What's up? A lot is the short version. <laughs> it's been it's been a bit of a turbulent transition in terms of uh, moving provinces with our kid and all house hunting and all those kind of different things, but I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy that uh, I'm here with you as well. Yeah, you guys chose just the worst time to do all of what you're doing, hey? I, You know what? This has been the most... There's been a, there has been so many serendipitous instances that yeah. led us to here to literally to where we are right now that uh, I have never experienced something like that before. So it was the best time. Mm, nice. Yeah. I love how, how things like, I, I could see that too, you know, like there's not a lot to do during COVID. There's a lot to do. And then there's also not a lot to do. And it's like, well, we're not, it's not like we're going out to parties and have all these social obligations. So Maybe it's a really great time to uh, to start looking for houses and stuff like that. Yeah, it was a, it, it was it was a really interesting fast transition. I mean, in April we decided to come, and then in Ju June was it July? July, July, we're here. Yeah. So it was just like, and it was the decision, and then getting the house ready for sale, and lining up all that kind of stuff, and then boom, we're in a place, right? Like it's pretty happen very quickly. <laughs> I love it. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's dive in. So right. I'll probably take some notes as you go. So if you see me looking down, that's that's what for. Um, what what are we going to kind of excavate? What are we going to look at? You know, I was originally I, I in that in the pre session questionnaire, I filled out that it was in regards to, um, you know, you talked about relationships, relationship, how I how I still have my business and the things that I want to build and still also have my relationship with my daughter because she's not in preschool. She's with us full time and I'm, I'm taking <laughs> most of our parenting duties at this particular point in time. Right. But, but I've, and the, the second thing that kind of came up was uh, not necessarily out of that, but in the, in the days since then was thinking about this idea of transition 
And I mean, the move is, is a significant part of that, but there is a lot of transition that's been happening for me for in, in the last probably year and a half. It was, in, it was pretty intense and sometime before that. And so now we're in this, we're in the, um, we're in the flow. Mm. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, so you, there's been kind of like a lot of upheaval, it sounds like, like a significant transition. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's where you find yourself. Yeah. We're now, we're now in transition. I feel like there was, there was this period of time when it was, um, there's a lot of trying to figure out the way that I've described it to the coach that I was working with was I felt like this ship that's in the fog in the middle of an ocean, it has everything it could possibly need, but has no idea where to go. And it's kind of tethered to somewhere. It just mm. completely kind of like lost at sea. And I feel like, and that's the, that's the metaphor that I've used a, a few times, but I feel like a lot of that has been unmoored. There have yeah. been a lot of things that we've had to let go to make this move happen, uh, to change the direction of my business. There was a lot of letting go and that those anchors have been uh, let go of. And now we're moving. And we made a transition to here. And now I'm kind of in this place of like, well, what do I want to create? What do I want to create now? What's what, what does life look like from this point forward? What does life look like for the next 10 years? Because I feel like it's all been building up to this. Mm. Right. And so, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. So where, where does it, where does it go? What, what is it? What are we doing? I uh, got it. So it's almost like you, everything's led up to this. Now you are, now you have this. Now, you're now what? Yeah. So there uh -huh. is, I have, and so there's also the now what, but there's also this, this like tension between, Hey, I still have to be a parent to my daughter almost full time. And mm -hmm. I have all, all these wants and needs that I want to build my business. I want to write, I want to interview people. And the, there it's, I'm unable to do all of the things. Mm. Right. So what, like, if we were, I guess I'm really clear on where you are. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, there's a lot of things we could kind of look at. Like if, is it, is there something in particular for us to look at? Like, ah, oh, I really want to make this happen, but I can't quite figure out how, or what, what would we aim towards in this conversation? It's a good question because there's a lot to untangle. Um, maybe re maybe to to pull it back so there is this place of transition and i mean eventually my daughter might go back to school so that so that so i'm kind of looking at two time horizons for the next month how do i reconcile being mostly dad and mm -hmm. then after the next month after september how do i then build up this new thing so where where does it feel like it has more energy i mean more tension is the dad versus business person uh -huh. And then this part here is perhaps a little less tense because I have a vision of where I want to go. Okay. Yeah. So what is the, what is that tension that you're describing? The tension is there's a lot of, um, it's difficult, right? And so I, I uh, having, you know, having your kid or kids full time with you with no school and that kind of stuff, you're locked in together as a family unit, especially with COVID. So it's not that just, there's no school, yeah. but you're also in COVID. So you're literally like caged together. Right. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's difficult, right? Cause I mean, you're, you're tending to a five, to, in our case, a five-year-old that requires your attention almost full time. And, uh, and in, at the same time, there's very little space for, for you, for me. And so, so that's been difficult. And so I've, I've noticed, um, it, you know, I react and then I feel guilty about it. Mm. And so, so that has been a part. And, and so I recognize that, you know, she's going to go to school and because she, when she starts going to school, we will never have this time again. But at the same time, I'm having a really tough time letting go of the work because I feel it's a calling. Right. And so, mm. so that's the, that's the tension. Got it. So how do you want it to be? Like, it sounds would, like we're talking this next month, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like it re hopefully next month we'll see what happens with the virus, right? Right. Uh, it might come back. So I'm very cognizant of that as well. I would like it to be more um, flowy, more. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of pressure that I put on myself for certain things. Uh -huh. And um, that's been a pattern for, well, forever. Um, so I think that is... Um, maybe to release some of that somehow, or to even just to make a decision to say that, you know, 
the difficult part is that there are opportunities that come my way and I'm like, uh -huh. I want to do this and I know that I can't. And so, so it, that's the hard part. Cause it's like this stuff, it's like, it's right there, but you just can't get it. Mm. So is it that you want to let go of these opportunities or is it that you want to pursue these opportunities, but also like kind of honor the work as dad, or is it that something different? I think, I think it's that as like, I would like, to, I would love to have the capacity to do both. Maybe capacity isn't the right word, but the, the ability to do both. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, so that's the stretch, right? Cause you're like holding on to these two things, just barely hanging on, navigating through life. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, and then, you know, you just still don't know what things are going to look like, um, or sorry, I still don't know what things are going to look like a month from now. Maybe school will be canceled. I don't know. And in which right. case it's, 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 Okay, then we're back in this space and, and uh, the inability to, it feels like an ability and maybe it isn't to go after some of these opportunities that, that I have in front of me would be like, that fills me up. But at the same time, I need to, you know, dedicate as a dad. I said a lot of things. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, let me share what I heard. Yeah. So it sounds like there's kind of a, First, you said like, well, you know, who knows what happens in the future? So that's tough. But then, you know, even though COVID makes it seem especially pronounced, we never know what's going to happen in the future, right? We can be committed to what we're committed to and the future will do what the future does. You'll be like, eh, eh. actually, this is what's going to happen. You're like, oh, okay, got it. That's going on. So, but I heard um, there's opportunities that you'd really like to pursue, there's time with your daughter and then you feel kind of like, it sounds like you're back and forth. You are in some kind of tension between those two things. Yeah. It's kind of like that Van Damme uh, thing that he did with uh, Volvo trucks where he was like, did the split across two trucks. That's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of what it feels like. Right. So should we look at the sort of like, well, I guess I'm kind of curious, like what are these opportunities? What's, what's happening there? So um, there are opportunities that I'm lining up for later this year in terms of work. So one is to work, it's to work with leaders and leadership teams yeah. um, and to write and to interview. So there's a lot of these things that, that, are, that have just been pent up and just waiting for an opportunity to, for an opportunity to do them. Yeah. Um, and not, I mean, realistically is, is to not really have the time to. So that's, those are some of the opportunities that are on the horizon. So are we talking like writing proposals or what is it that you don't have time to do uh, writing? So it would be, for example, doing like, I have a podcast that I recently kicked off the other day. So I would yeah. love to get back into that. I loved interviewing people for that. Uh, innovative leaders is who I, who I'm connecting with, supporting them. I've had an opportunity to connect with, uh, with a couple of different innovation networks and I want to support that kind of work. That's what really fires me up. And uh, so, and then the writing part of it would be to write the articles, right? I've, I've done a lot of writing and I really haven't for the last year and a half. So all of that is just like waiting in the wings. Got it. So it sounds like you want to be interviewing people. You want to be writing more. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things I heard there. Is that right? So interviewing people, writing more, coaching, uh, working with leadership teams, you know, if I have an opportunity to, to run a, to run some kind of an event, that would be another thing to, to do, uh, making connections. So that kind of activity uh -huh. is, is, um, you know, held back by the reality of the situation. And what is it that, so is it like, what would you say it is that holds you back? Like, I know we've talked about sort of like, oh, your daughter, but that's kind of nebulous, right? Like what in particular about that is holding you back? So it's not that she, it's not that she holds me back. It's yeah, I got that. the dedication of uh, it's, it's the time, right? Cause I mean, realistically during the day uh, from the time we wake up to the time that we fall asleep, um, you know, me, both me and my wife are, are starting to kind of juggle responsibilities. She has a job that she's working remotely. So I'm playing Mr. Dad for most of the day, which is, you know, awesome i love it and at the same time in the back of my mind there's this real like oh, i should be doing this i should be doing that like and, and i can't and so there's that that guilt cuts both ways right you feel guilty for not pursuing writing not doing enough as a yeah. in your career and then also guilty for not doing enough is, is it for not being fully present i think that's the thing that that i dislike about that the most 
Got it. Yeah. So I get these as like um, kind of like feelings or, you know, a, a bit of uh, well, actually, hold on. Let me speak to people watching first. So we've gotten clear on like where Ernest is. We're kind of clear on where he wants to be. That's sort of becoming a little more clear. And we're like, we're working with these three things. Where is he? Where does he want to be? And what's the gap? So right now, the, the kind of thrust of the conversation we're in is like, oh, what's the thing in the way? Oh, I don't have enough time. I'm not feeling fully present. So you've probably heard me if you've ever watched or listened to these before. Like there's four things we look for in coaching. Where are they? Where do they want to be? What's the gap? And then we once we have those three things, we coach to close the gap. And it's not always linear when we're pulling those things out. So sometimes it'll be really clear. Here's where I am. Here's where I want to go. Here's the gap. But often it's more like you start to explore the gap and then you get curious, like, well, if that wasn't there, what would you get? And they're like, oh, well, then I could have. And you're like, oh, got it. So that's more of where they want to be. And as you explore that more, it starts to become a little more clear about exactly what's in the way. So that's what we're kind of doing here with Ernest. So what like i get that sense of not being fully present and i'm i'm kind of curious i don't know about you but i know for me at least as far as like feeling like i've done enough that's an impossible game maybe like three times every month i've got a day where I'm like yeah i did everything i did it all i did i did good but for the most part if you were to ask me based on how i feel about what i created I'm going to be kind of like, I'm a pretty driven guy and I'm going to be like, ah, I didn't create enough. There was more I should have done. If you were to ask, oh, they do write so much and he's crazy and he's always producing content and I don't understand how he does it. So there's a bit of a, a disconnect there, right? Between my feeling and what I produce and how other people experience that. Mm -hmm. What I'm curious about is if we just set aside that feeling of not being fully present and the guilt, which I completely get, and I'm not saying it's not there, but I'm just curious, like, what is your commitment in terms of what you do or your output or what you create with your daughter or what is it you're committed to? So tell me more about that. I'm not 100% uh, clear. What, what part's not clear? So what do you mean by what am I committed to? Uh, I mean, in terms of, <clears throat> are you thinking in terms of like, what am I might be over committed to? No, nope. I'm, I'm wondering more like, so our commitment is like, this is what I'm committed to doing regardless of how I feel. Okay. Like for example, every morning I'm committed to writing for an hour. What are you committed right. to as far as your daughter's concerned? So I'm committed to being there when basically for, for the day from, I have, um, you know, like after breakfast or so I'm with her until my wife has done her work. And so okay. that's, that is a commitment that. I'm there. And, now, and so what's the, well, let me, is there if I ask some questions too? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what, what time, give me the times. We're just going to get silly and sure. Um, 830 to three, let's say. Okay, great. So from 830 AM to 3 PM, you're committed to being in relationship with your daughter. Yeah. Okay, great. And then please continue. And then there's also like a gray area before and after. So from, from 3.30 to 7, there's also this area where I'm still in it, but I'm not 100% the, uh, the only parent. Okay. And so again, is it, there... It depends on day-to-day -to -day too. Like that's what I mean by gray. So sometimes my, my wife will work till 5. And so, so it's just a flex. Got it. And so what, how would you like, if we were to keep bringing this back to like that lens of like what you're committed to, how would you, how would you speak that through this lens? What's the commitment there? The commitment that I would like to have is the one that I'm fully present for that time. And from so, three thirty to seven, from seven to three thirty. Uh, hold on. Let, oh, I might sorry, have gotten oh, lost. For that time, we're talking about the gray one. Yeah, because we've got 830 yeah. to 3, right, so which right. is you, you're committed to being with your daughter. You're there yeah. with her, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and ideally, you have mind control over yourself and all you are focused on is her and That's none it. of the other stuff, hopefully. <laughs> but I got um, it. And then so from 330 to 7, what's the commitment? From 330 to 7, it's, it's, it's loose, right? Okay. So we don't have a clear commitment. So it's, right. it's I'm, I'm, I'm in, if I'm needed, I'm some, like, I have an opportunity to like maybe go out for, for a little bit to do some errands. So it's, it's a little bit more flexible from that perspective. So there isn't a clear commitment. 
And yet I'm willing to bet that there is some kind of commitment underneath that. It might not be as hard. It might not be as like from 830 to three or from seven, 330 to seven, I'm here with her hundred percent. Right. But like, I really want to invite you to get clear. Like, what am I committed to in okay. that space? Yeah. In that case, it's like, so in terms of like what's underneath that, what's the subconscious commitment? Because yeah. there are some times where my mom would be like, she'll come in and she's like, okay, so now you go and do stuff. And sometimes I'll just like, I'm bolted out of the door I'm, 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 or like in, in, into writing or whatever that is. Um, and we like, I also want to be conscious of the fact that we do create space for each other. And, and uh, so we, we, we are making it work, which has been really fantastic. Uh, and, and I want to recognize that too. She's been such an incredible help without sure. her, we wouldn't be here. Um, and uh, so the commitment from that time, what I have troubles letting go of during that time is also this being with my family because it's like I want to be with them and so now that we're all together let's say I want to be here and I don't want to be like off doing something else separately okay so that's so that's the that's that's the I don't know it wouldn't be subconscious but that's what that's a layer underneath so your commitment from 3 30 to 7 is to spend time with your family yeah, it's I, I feel like this is our time to be together. Let's go do stuff and uh, and, you know, we'll have dinner and all that kind of stuff. OK, yeah. be with family. Mm -hmm. When do you go to bed? Depends on the day. Sometimes it's nine, sometimes it's ten. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's many parents it's, listening. Like, geez, this guy's got a one hour window and that's nothing. Yeah, Sometimes it's like four in the morning. Other times is I fall asleep. Exactly. So, right. Um, so it, it varies by the day and circumstances. Sometimes we're like, we've had a long day, like, and, and you're like, I'm done. You know, by yeah. the time we're finished dinner and, and she's, she's sleeping, I'm like, I, I don't have any mental capacity to, to, to perform anything. And it's just like, I'm, we're done. Got it. So like, but it sounds like there's like sort of maybe two to three hour window from seven is 7 PM when your daughter goes to bed. Yeah. So, and like, then you've there, got like a, there's a two, there's a two hour window of, of there's a two hour window, let's say. Yeah. Got it. Okay, great. So what do you, what do you notice first of all, just about like what you're committed to? I'm noticing that it, it's, it's this interesting underlying commitment that is, it's the, no, let me, let me rephrase that. It's the trouble with letting go. And so, for example, I, I would have the ability to go do something for an hour at three, but I don't because I want to be with family. Right. Uh -huh. And so, and so, um, and, and the underneath of that, there's also this, like I mentioned, there's this like sense of guilt where, you know, if I wasn't present during the, during the, during the day and I was checking my phone and I was, you know, or organizing a house hunt or whatever else, or I was trying to reply to client emails, then uh, that I feel like I didn't serve my purpose during that time. So therefore for, from the time my wife comes home and is available to the time that she falls asleep, I feel like I have to kind of continue contributing Oh, wow. So there's like a real like debt of presence that gets accumulated. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh -huh. yeah. So what is the story about that? Like, what's your story about your time with your daughter? Mm. I'm hearing that like a fair bit. It, it is. I mean, that's that's the it, it's a big driver. So the way that I see it is that it's my responsibility as a parent to be with her. I'm also very cognizant of the fact that this specific age until they go to kindergarten you have this time and you'll never have it again. Yeah. Right. And so once they start going to school, it, it completely changes the entire makeup of, of everything. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's this like loss that I am um, loss of that time coming in September that we'll never get back. Uh -huh. so that's a big driver for me in terms of um, where I put my efforts. And then, you know, like, knowing that being in the moment and I'm like, Oh, I should reply to that email. Oh, I should write this out or, or I need to check out this house or, and so when that ha that's happening, it's creating these like little uh, accumulations of debts of uh, what do you call it? Debts of attention, presence. debts of presence. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, I have done. And then by the time, you know, the evening rolls around, I'm like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I need to like now re 
engage and, and be more present, like be extra present. You know what I mean? <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I really got that. Like, it's kind of like, oh, I was on my phone for, and I don't know to what extent your calculation is, but you seem like a guy who's pretty dialed in on himself. Like oh, I was on the phone for like, mm, give or take an hour. Therefore I really need to like make up for it in this time from here. Um, so it, it, to hear you describe it, it sounds like that time is scarce and it's, there's a duty, duty, not duty. And you're going to lose this time. Like it's, it's yeah. almost like I got this idea, this image of like the hourglass and watching the sands drip out of it. Totally. And from that, it sounds like you then like kind of get really significant about it. Like it's not just time with your daughter. It's like this time really matters. There's a real the significance time. around it. Yeah. There, 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 it's the time there is, there is not a reserve for it. It's not a year ago when we would have had an extra year. This is it. Got it. Okay. So I'm just going to speak to everyone else. It feels at this point, kind of like we found the thing to look at. So we've been talking for, I don't know how long, probably a half hour to whatever. And it feels like we've kind of gotten down to like the nugget that's at play for Ernest. I don't even know that that's just my sense. And um, so it's just worth noticing like, so much of coaching when we're like, we have to create the breakthrough for them. That's going to change everything and give them the silver bullet. That'll change their life forever. Right now it gets in the way of our ability to just sort of be in that exploration. So what I'm curious now is how is, how is it from, hold on, let me just word this the right way. So there this time with your daughter, and it's significant and scarce and like it's there's kind of like a duty and it's not like a duty you begrudge but it's still a bit of a like fuck you know i gotta i gotta do this i gotta make the most of this what is your experience from that relationship to it what is my experience from that relationship to from the relate from the uh relationship of duty so all the whole relationship is like my time with my daughter during this, this time is precious, scarce. I'm going to lose it. You know, it's significant. Yeah. And there's like this real duty to like really make the most of it. Right. I'm curious, like I could imagine that from relating to it that way, you might have a particular experience as a result of oh, that relating like to it. A, what, what happens as a result? Well, what happens as, yeah. a, as a result is this, uh, I mentioned guilt earlier, right? Uh -huh. uh, so that's one thing that happens as a, as a result. The other one is this, like, I'm catching myself being distracted and I'm also catching myself. I'm like, well, we have to go, you know, look at a house. I mean, we're in a particular point in time where we're looking for a house, but we have to go do this so we can have a place to live. So uh -huh. there's, there's all of these have to's. Yeah. And, and then trying to hold it all together is, is the part that's really difficult and stressful. Um, so it's, Got it's, it. the, uh, it's, and I'm also, you know, and, and there's also this level of knowing that I can't hold physically impossible to hold on to all of those things, but I'm trying yeah. really hard. You're doing a great job trying though. Yeah. I'm trying I really, really hard. Yeah. Like one of the things I want to really acknowledge you for Ernest is like how much you care as a dad. You know, like I really get this isn't from this is from like really wanting to be a father and soak in fatherhood and get the most out of these precious moments with your children, your child. And like I really get um I'm just humbled by like how much you care from that regard. So I, I first really want to acknowledge you for that. Thank you. Do you get that about yourself? Like are you present to that? To some degree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Degree. Like, like yeah, a degree, right. yeah. like to a degree. Yeah. Literally one degree. Uh, degree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So I just want to, I really want to reflect that to you. Like this isn't something that a deadbeat or like a dad that, you know, your guilt probably is telling you like, you're not doing enough. You're not a good enough dad, blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah. And I'm sure that the world is backing that up too. And plenty of evidence to support that out there somewhere. I'm really present to how much you care. Um, and, and I'm also present to like how this 
story, this relationship to that significance leads to like a lot of guilt. There's not a lot of room for distraction and it's kind of difficult and stressful. Mm -hmm. What do you think your daughter might be learning from seeing you model this? I don't know. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to visualize what this would look like from her eyes. And it's uh, the, the part of me that feeds the guilt is that my dad isn't present. You know, my dad's on his phone. The, my dad is on his laptop. My dad is writing something, right? Like, and so, so that is, that is the part that, that is the real in the back of my mind. Um, Right. That's the part that's like purely the guilt, the story of the guilt, right? <laughs> like, oh, look at all the things dad's not doing. And what yeah. she's learning is dad's not present. Right. And but so, there's a so whole the, bunch of other stuff you're doing too, right? There is. So like, I mean, I'll yeah. take her to the beach. We hiked up Mount Doug yesterday or we'll like, I want to do all the cool things with her. So, so she yeah. gets to have these amazing experiences. Like we'll go swimming. We'll go look for, you know, twigs and trees and build stuff and chase each other and play soccer and, and all those kind of things. And so those are the kinds of memories that I would like her to have of this time. Like we just moved to this amazing place. Right. And so um, it's not, I don't, I don't feel it's. Oh, did you freeze? That was kind of cool. Let's see if the, I think the stream's going to freeze. I'm going to wait for it to catch up and then yeah, there we go. You frozen. I'm going to wait for you to come back, but I'm going to speak to everyone else watching. Cause I think I'm still going here. So, just see if you can notice like um, one, how much Ernest cares, especially given as a function of how hard he is on himself. You know, there's not a lot of um, room for his humanity at play here. You know, it's you very, go. oh, you're back. You've just come yeah. back. Great. This is very like severe, right? Um, you were saying. Mm -hmm. So you do these uh, hikes, you do this cool stuff. Yeah, so we do all this stuff. And, and um, uh, these are the kind of memories that I would like her to have of this time. And I'm also yeah. aware of all the, you know, psychology, reading, learning, and, and, and development stuff that I've done is that it's those things are nice, but it's these, it's these like instances of criticism or harshness or something didn't work quite right that will determine their worldview. So I'm like super cognizant of, of, of that as well. Yes. Well, so let me give you a different way to look at it. Imagine that your daughter is like getting to hike and swim and do all these things. She's got a dad who cares a great deal about like how he fathers her, regardless of what your guilt might tell you about that. Right. And then at the same time, who her dad is being about it is about him as dad is guilty, feeling guilty, not much room for distraction, kind of difficult, kind of stressed. So what do you think that would like by watching how you be with yourself, what do you think that would, what do you think she would learn or see or be taught from that? Well, I mean like that on a, on a subconscious level, because she's probably picking all of that stuff up anyways. Right. Yeah. I mean, it might make her feel the same thing where I guess if I think about it on a deeper level, it might make her feel guilty that she's the cause of it. Right. And that's, and that's like, well, let me, let me pause you. Cause I want to, um, I want to have you, you're looking sort of in the right angle, but there's like a slightly different thing. So I'm asking, what do you think she's learning purely from watching kids learn from what's modeled? Mm -hmm. Right. So what do you think is being modeled for her? I see, like, I, I see these two sides, right? So one is we get to do a really cool, bunch of really cool, fun stuff that I want to do. And then at the same time, uh, my dad's stressed out. Right. So it's kind of like we can do a lot of cool stuff yeah. and it's going to be quite stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Yes. That's kind of, that's kind of, if you combine the two, that's, that's the. Yeah. And I'm also present to like, it's never enough. Yeah. There is Are that you, too. Can you see that? I mean, the, the never enough thing is that, you know, I was even looking at my schedule. Uh, we already did a bunch of stuff before we hopped in a call and, and everything is like slices of five minutes availability between things. I just got my license today from BC and the way that it worked out, I just got home just in time to hop on the call. Right. So it was just like. Right. 
it's very, it's very, um, what's the word? Uh, busy, I guess. I'm not, busy might not be the right word, but it's very like. Yeah. Well, and so from, it's, it's kind of cool. Well, kind of cool. It's kind of interesting or even fascinating. <laughs> You're doing all of this stuff and it's never enough, right? Like there's always more, pre is there ever a point when you've been present enough with your daughter? There have been moments. Gauge those moments. It's, it's, I, I feel it. Right. So exactly. Example, yeah. Right. So it's a feeling and you've probably noticed like me that your feelings are kind of fucking fickle. Yeah. They're like, yay, just like I get one one day a month where I'm like, yeah, I feel like I did enough, right? But it's not really a reflection of the objective reality of my life or what I actually create or anything. It's whatever's going on in my internal chemistry, right? If our feelings are like the weather. Mm -hmm. So what would you want your daughter? Like if she was taking this lesson forward into the future, so she's sort of like learning, oh, this is how it is to be a father and or yes, anywhere else where you, yeah, like what would you want her to be learning in this? What's the lesson you'd really want her to learn? To, I, it's, it's the same thing that I would want for me and that's a sense of ease. Uh-huh, got right? it. And, and so I, I am still, that's still an unfamiliar thing to me because I, everything that I've done was, it was always a push. It was always like, you know, get after things, make it happen. Cool. Next thing. Right. You know, yeah. I remember when I, uh, uh, in 2017, I did a TEDx talk and that was the, that was the biggest thing. I never thought I would be able to do one. Yeah. And then I remember, you know, after that I went into, into, I, I keep saying, you know, it's a terrible thing and I, you're fine. Yeah. Cognizant of, of not saying that too much. Uh, I remember going into the back room and I just kind of collapsed in my wife's arms and there was this big moment that happened and it's now it's done. And then I was like, well, now what? Yeah. Right. And so, and then it was this period of time. I'm like, well, I don't know what to do next. And then later that day, I started a podcast conference. <laughs> and so, so there is this, there is that, which is a yeah. pattern for me. Um, yeah. And what would it, what would it be if it was easy? What if it, there was a sense of ease? I know people that have that, that have that software. I just, I just don't have it yet. Well, so first of all, totally relatable. I got that. Like I, the, the training I got growing up was like, you better work hard. You better work hard, Adam. Working hard is important. And then that, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. And then that became when I noticed I was working hard, but still got told you better work hard. I was like, oh, I guess I'm not working hard enough. And then that over time, as, as I internalized, it just became, you're not enough. And so what is there to do when you're not enough? Work harder, be more, do more. And so I can really, re that's not necessarily your story or how you came by it, but there's a familiarity, a similarity to those two things. And on the one hand, I can imagine, well, let's just check this out first. So with your daughter, when you're feeling like you're not enough present is one of the things you then know to do is like double down on being present with her. Yes. I mean, that, that's one of them. Right. So I, I, yeah. I really focus in on her and the thing is like, she <laughs> yeah. might be doing something else or, or right. Like, it's like, what are you doing? Let's talk. Dad, you're breathing like, on my neck. It's weird. You, yeah, like, it's like, what are you feeling? What's happening? What are you thinking about? And yeah. she might be doing something else. So like, I mean, if I were to put myself into her shoes, she might have been playing with something and here's dad, like, yeah. Extra Being weird. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, so kind of pervasive. We could probably find this pattern everywhere. Like if we were to look or a bunch of places, at least mm -hmm. not enough, and then do more of whatever it is you're not enough of. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I want to acknowledge this isn't necessarily even a bad thing. Like you are probably reliable in situations to work hard when that's what's called for to like find a way to knuckle down and to get more done, to work harder, to like make things happen. When other people would be like, ah, whatever, it's good enough. Would that be fair? Yeah, like good enough is not the way. No, no, a, what are you talking about? There's no such thing, <laughs> right? So what do you think would be required from yourself to have a sense of ease without any of your circumstances changing? So what I mean is 
you're not doing anything different. You're not being more present. You're not checking your phone less. What do you think would be needed in order to have a sense of ease with just how things are? Well, you know, the thing that ah, I caught myself again, what I heard from, from this and the thought that popped into my mind and was physically, when I was thinking about the idea, here's me as a five-year-old playing. And then here's my dad being extra present, wanting to have some kind of a, a validation of the extra presence that, okay, I now forgive you or nice whatever. Catch. Right. Um, it's so that's another letting go for me. That's what I heard. And, and what that is, is, you know, this, I don't even know how to say it eloquently, but it is what it is. What happened, happened. And by being extra present, that doesn't help things by being, have, adding that extra intensity, it doesn't help things. It just creates more stress. So it's, it's the letting go of, it's the letting go in the moment of everything that happened before. And yeah. that, like you said, that debt, I, I take in, So instead of letting go, I take all of this and flip it into the next moment. I'm like, okay, let's yeah, take yeah. your stuff, right? Like, okay, here, here's, you know, here's whatever. the debt you have to pay off. Right. Yeah. So it, it's that debt being reset in the moment and being so what, okay with that. Yeah. So what would you need to give yourself or what would you need or what would support you in letting go in the moment? So how would I practice that is the question that's, that's popping for me. So how would I be able to do that? And that image of literally trying to put myself into my daughter's shoes or, or whoever else, my dad, my wife, client, whatever. Um, because it's, it's my own sense of, I guess, guilt and that debt that I then create this extra intensity from, and it's unnecessary. So how would I practice that? So how would I let go of that debt in the moment? And if it's and, in and presence I'm, or whatever else. I'm happy to let you go down that path. I just want to make sure that, because the question I'm asking is maybe half a step before that, which is just, are you even clear what you'd need? And then if you're clear on what you need to be able to let go of that, then it might be great. How do you practice getting that? Okay. I think that's, it, it's almost there, but I don't, it's not super, it's not hundred percent clear. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into that mind space. And the thing that's popping up for me is that I would want permission, validation, forgiveness from the person that I'm, that I feel like I've wronged. Uh huh. Who do you think that person is? Well, it could be my daughter. It could be, you know, a client. It, 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 ah, it could be my daughter. It could be my client. It could be my wife. It could be whoever I feel like I didn't bring a hundred percent to. And in that sense, that sense of duty that you mentioned, I feel like that's the, like I went, when I'm in it, it I want to be a hundred percent. And if I brought 90%, that's the debt. And then I feel that I owe them that, whoever that is. Yeah. Who's the arbitrator of all of this? Like, it, well, actually, sorry, I have an assertion. I'm just going to label it as an assertion rather than ask a sneaky question. Yeah. It occurs like you're the arbitrator in all of this. For sure. It's like self-flagellation. Yeah. So it sounds like what you're saying is, in order to let yourself off the hook, so to speak, you'd need to give yourself forgiveness and validation and, and permission to have done what you've done, to have shown up the way you've shown up. And, and the, the, the question that's popping up in my mind is that is enough for me to do that or do I need the other person to give me that? <laughs> well, we know it'll never be enough. Right. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I notice, though, like it doesn't seem like your daughter's complaining a lot about you not being present or anything like that. And it doesn't sound like, it sounds like wherever yeah, we all. go, Ernest is the constant. We could well, plug definitely. different people into this. Yeah. So it occurs like maybe the place to start might be 
at the constant before we start to check with other people. There might be some forgiveness required, but I noticed that before you even get out there, there's like this internal kind of flagellation going on as you to use your word. Yeah, there, there is. Yeah. And it's, 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 uh, yeah, there is absolutely. So how could you practice that? How could, what would be some ways to practice forgiving yourself? See, that's still unfamiliar to me because I haven't really done it. It's not the way that I operate. Mm. Um, that's an unknown and I would like to figure that out. Okay. So have you ever practiced forgiving? Like, would you forgive other people? <laughs> depends. Don't open that can and of worms. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. And yes and no. And I think I'm okay. pretty, I'm pretty harsh. I'm pretty, uh, uh, maybe not harsh isn't the right word, but I'm pretty, uh, I have high expectations yeah. and of others and I have higher expectations of myself. Right. And so, so that's, that's, you know, that's part of the driver. And so when I, and I said like, I'm at, when I do 90% out of a hundred percent, that is the, it's the 10% that hurts. Yeah, totally. So, okay, great. So then sounds like you don't have a lot of practice with forgiveness. No, actually I don't. Cool. Okay, yeah. great. So I can give you some, some ways to practice, but I'm curious, like, we'll just have you practice anyhow. How's that pen smell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being silly. It like hands. <laughs> for people watching, Ernest just put a pen up to his nose for some reason. <laughs> so um, how do you think you might practice? I get it. You don't have any sort of experience of this. It's kind of a new thing, but what do you think might help you get a little more forgiveness permission in those moments when you catch this going on? Well, the first thing that's coming to my mind is something that I've actually done with clients is the I forgive myself for mm. as a statement mm -hmm. when I catch it. Okay. Because that is, yeah, I mean, r really it comes down to forgiveness because this debt is, is based on guilt and, 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 and all of these different feelings for which where the debt be forgiven, I guess, sticking with that metaphor, um, it's freeing. Do you, um, are you able to see that that debt is made up? Like there's no Def object. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. It's all me. It's all self-imposed. Yeah. Well, that's great. Cause it sounds like you don't always relate to it that way. Sometimes you're like, no, I'm no. doing like lasting harm to my daughter or something like that. And it's like, um, fathers who are absent do not have conversations like this one <laughs> that's not the conversation they're in right they don't they're not racked with guilt they're like i'm gonna go have another beer i don't i don't care yeah. and so part of it might be just seeing like oh the, that's created i'm creating that and look it served you to create that up to this point in your life because from that you're reliable to go and do a bunch of stuff mm. right it's just that it sounds like now even though you're reliable to do a bunch of stuff, you're not so stoked on like the guilt that you always have to live with. So there's been practice that I, this um, process that I've been going through for the last few years, it was, it was this, I, I kind of call it peeling back the layers of personality that I've slapped on, on top, on top of myself for, for decades. And uh, in the, in the peeling back and letting go, I'm getting closer back to, myself. I mean, this yeah. is going to be super esoteric and weird, but it's, it's, and this is one of those layers that I didn't even see. Yeah. It's, and, and forgiveness is the best way to describe it. And it's still foreign to do that for myself. I'm okay with doing it for someone else, but to do it for myself is weird. And, 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 and um, uh, what's the word? Un, un, it's, not, it's not unnatural, but it's unknown. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and if we call naturalness, what we've, we're used to doing, you know, like what's right. natural for me is what I'm used to doing. Then it would be unnatural. It's not your default right now. Mm -hmm. Right now your default is so, so uh, yeah, totally. Right. Like I'm going to hold that on myself and then you're going to use it to do more of, right. and like, you know, it's not like even from this, it's going to create 
bad things, your daughter's going to have a father very present, which I assert you are. It's just, she's also going to learn like, and it's never enough. So she's going to learn the same thing. I'm, she's going to be really committed to like being present or to playing or whatever. And it's never going to be enough because that's what she's seeing modeled. Right. Yeah. So I heard you say like, okay, one thing I could do is just when I catch this, I forgive myself for this. Yeah. Now you mentioned there's also something else that uh, you might have in your back pocket as a yeah. practice. Well, so the first thing, this, the one of the things I would suggest is noticing, just noticing this show up. So there's, look, we're all distracted. And these days in 2020 with phones and stuff, our attention span is worse. It, it's not even worse. It's just shorter yeah. than ever before. Right. And so you've got a story that that's wrong, but I invite you to notice that that story is made up. You have a bunch of evidence for it and you probably came by it honestly, meaning like your parents probably trained you in it somehow, or, you know, you got evidence to back that story up, but it's a created story. Fair. Mm -hmm. And so I would just, as a practice, have you notice that story as it shows up. So the way you might do that is like, you're on your phone, you're dealing with stuff, you hang up, you see your daughter playing on the beach and you're like, ah, Ernest. And you're like, oh, that's the story right in this moment. I'm making it wrong that I was distracted. In truth, there isn't even anything really to forgive yourself for. Forgiveness is still a little bit inside of the story that it's like wrong what you did, but it's a starting point, right? Like it, it, get, it so it's not really, we want to get you out of that box entirely. So it's just like, oh, yeah. I was just so distracted. It's like a couple of layers deep. Yeah. yeah. But for now, right? Because you get so wound out around it, like even just breathing and like, oh, it's okay. I forgive. I forgive for my humanity. Mm -hmm. And I forget just the same way you would forgive your daughter for her humanity. Yeah. You might get mad at her first, but you work yourself out because you care about her and you love her. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, she's just screaming. It's annoying. <laughs> but <laughs> it's literally doing very hop to the call. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I forgive her. So it's giving yourself the same grace. And so that's sort of like the inside of the box kind of thing we're working with. And then the other place I'm going to invite you to practice is starting to just notice the box itself. Oh, here is that story again, that it's wrong, that I got distracted, that it's not enough presence. I'm just writing this down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for doing so. Yeah. And, and what's, uh, what's coming up for me is to actually do some more research around forgiveness. Yeah. Pono Pono is one place to look, the Hawaiian practice. Okay. Are you familiar with that one? I am not actually, so that's great. Um, it's a four-step process. I think it's, I, I, I always miss one of them. It's, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me, I love you. Let me look it up right now so that I'm not sort of trying to, oh no, Pono. Sounds like the, uh, um... I'm totally blanking on the name. It's the uh, 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 kindness Buddhist practice. What's it called? Tonglen? Is that what you're thinking of? No. Um, wow. Uh, kind, uh, holy cow. Why am I not? <laughs> It'll come back to me. It's like, may you be, may you be well. Are you yes. Okay. So it's, it's something kindness and I can't remember what it is. Uh, do I have it here? I'm going to look quickly. And if it doesn't show up, then we're going to just move past this. Yeah. Uh, but you can, you can look it up loving as well. Kindness. That's it. Loving yeah. kindness. Yeah. yeah. So the first step asks you to say, sorry. So I'm sorry. Uh, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. So I'm sorry. Forgive me. Thank you. I love you. You'd be doing this with yourself, not with your daughter. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So like, <laughs> I'm sorry for getting distracted on my phone. Please forgive me for my humanity for. Yeah, I'll check that out. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. And I really invite you to notice the um, so note, don't get just stuck in the forgiveness part. 
Yeah. Also make a practice of noticing the box you put yourself in. The story. I mean, that's the underlying OS, right? That's running yes. all of this stuff. So I, I get right. that. Yeah. Sorry, please. No, that's it. It's, it's the under, like, I mean, I, I get it. Like it's a layer below. I think it's this yeah. is just one way to get access to it. And then noticing where the story comes from. What does it mean? Where, what, uh, I mean, eventually that will be something that I would love to let go of as well. Yeah, because the truth is there's... <laughs> All there really is to do is to notice, oh, I got distracted. My commitment is to be as present as I can with my daughter. So I'm going to forgive myself if I need to, and then I'm going to choose back from my commitment. All right, I'm going to put my phone away. Whereas right now, it's there's it becomes like a burden, and then you got to double down, and then blah, 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 and then there's all the skill. from like 100% to 99%, so there's 1%, right? And then yeah. like, totally. And so you yeah. accumulate to like, 15,000 <laughs> percent by this time it's just like yeah okay. yeah that makes sense that's uh, I like that a lot actually this gives me this gives me something really great to work with beautiful and I can see it creating some ease anything else you see you might practice coming from this I would like to I mean, this, this kind of gives me some tools that I still want to learn more about. It's, I can see, I can see a lot of things coming from it because it's resetting in the moment and having the awareness to be able to reset. Um, there is that, uh, you know, I wrote about, ah, I caught myself again. I wrote about Kalpas before. Are you familiar with Kalpas? Yeah. Sounds, I don't know the, I can't remember the exact it's a word. Unit of but... time and there, uh, I can't remember right. how many there are in a day. It's a Buddhist time system. And so the idea, and so com combined with the idea that you're constantly being reborn every second, every day, you know, the universe is created every, every Kalpa. Um, you have the ability to completely shift every one of those moments. And so, yes. But in order to completely recreate re the universe, I feel like you can't carry the debt from the previous one. And that's, that's the thing. That's, that's the uh, point that I would like to get to. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. The last thing I think might be interesting is to notice the way you do forgiveness everywhere. Mm -hmm. At least for me, the word I would often use is completion as opposed to forgiveness, but they're kind of synonymous in this conversation. Mm. I would the way I would forgive people is that I would, the forgiveness would kind of sound like it's okay that they did that. It's just because they weren't educated enough or they were just stupid or whatever, but I forgive them for it. I forgive them for doing that thing that was wrong. And then I'd like bury and pave over the top of it. So I could like kind of operate pretty well, but I was still holding that they did something wrong, which isn't really true forgiveness. Like, true forgiveness is sort of getting ourselves to the point where it's like, we can kind of release, we're not even holding that it was wrong or that it should have gone any different. Yeah. That's not saying we give them permission to keep doing it. We, we still assert boundaries and do all that stuff, but just how I was holding it is a very different place. And so you might just get curious, like, how do I do forgiveness? What does that look like for me? So you can start to see both how it gets put externally and how it gets done internally. Yeah. And I, and in, in, in my particular instance, whatever I do externally is 10 times more intense internally. Yes. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. That's for all of us really, yeah. which helps us have a little bit of compassion for people. We're like, Oh my God, this person does that out there. Well, they're doing it way more in here. I don't have to be with it 24 hours a day. I just have to be with them for the annoying hour once a day. They're doing that constantly to themselves. Um, that feels like a good place for us to wind down. How's that feel for you? It does. I feel complete. Okay, great. I was just going to ask if there is, before I acknowledge you, anything else for you to be or feel like we're complete? I feel complete. This was great. Okay, cool. So may I acknowledge you, Ernest? You may. Cool. All you have to do for this is just not talk and receive what I have to say. So, um, man, I really acknowledge you for the tremendous depth of your heart and just how many fucks you give. I really, I really get you're a man committed to excellence. And I also really get you're committed to part of the journey you're on is a commitment to excellence merged with like a, a nice, wide open, fully expressed heart, like the one you have. And um, excellence and a stand for excellence from a closed heart can sometimes occur like Sometimes I was given that as a kid and it can occur like, here's how you're not enough, Adam. 
And I really honor you, Ernest, for the hard work of like forgiveness and opening your heart back up so you can stand for our best art and also love all of us for the art that we created in the moment. You know, this was my best art right here and I can do better. And that to me really occurs like who you are as a man, as a coach, as a leader, as someone absolutely committed to the greatness in everyone and to loving, to finding your way back to loving them exactly as they've shown up in the moment. Thanks for just being an incredible father and really like loving your daughter so much that you'll flagellate yourself for her. It's truly remarkable. And um, <laughs> thanks for giving her the gift of having a sense of humor about, and also just the awareness of, oh, maybe sometimes I'm being a little overly creepily present with her. And that could, <laughs> that could be annoying. And, um, and just holding that with some lightness, really beautiful work. Thank you for that. Cool. So um, let's just do a quick debrief and then we'll finish up. Um, anything you're present to, anything where you're like, oh, I thought we were going to go there or we didn't or, you know, just what's there for you? Usually when I'm in these kind of conversations, it's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go wherever. I don't have an agenda. It's, it's we're happy to go. And I'm glad that... Um, Forgiveness is not something where I would have thought that we would end up. Me neither. Yeah. And and uh, I also understand even even creating that visual representation or uh, or a concept of the idea that that's only on the cover of what's actually happening was it was another. Um, you know, I understand it intellectually, and I think it's different when you feel it and you yes. are experiencing it, and then you can embody it. And uh, I can see this as being a, a really, uh, a really big thing for me and the people that I that I that I support and serve. Yeah, I never know where we're gonna go. It's part of why these are always a little anxiety producing for me. Usually, thirty, I'm like, what's gonna happen? I don't have it controlled and laid out, and. Uh, Definitely, you know, for the first part of our conversation, I was really like, oh, I'm curious. Like, I wonder what the thing is. You know, what is there for us actually to coach around for us to take a look at? And um, I'm glad that it went the way it did, because I think that's so important as coaches that we really let go of the agenda for how it's meant to get somewhere or even that it's meant like one of the best things a coach can do for their client is let go of their need for the client to generate value in a conversation, which is kind of oxymoronic, but that's what then gives someone the freedom to really have things go. However, like then you can really lead as client. All right, I'm going to go here. How did that go for you? It sucked. Great. Now, you know, next time, maybe don't go there or keep going there and know it's going to suck. Um, forgiveness is a neat place for us to be. And really uh, it's uh, my people that's a place where often like for me, it's a, just a constant ongoing, like, Oh, now I'm learning to practice at that level. And I also, it's, um, you know, the idea that it might still be a little bit inside that box reminds me of the, the sort of Zen teaching where people are like, we're trying to get to this place of no concepts, but you're giving me concepts to do it. And that's kind of like, yeah, to get you free of concepts, we kind of have to create some concepts first you, there's a point in your, in your progression for all of us where we need to like, let go of that thing. And the same is true for any box we're in, right? We step into the next box and we're like, ha, now I have the belief that will, that will solve everything until it doesn't. And it's like, oh, now I got to let go of that belief. That was the all premise that. of the conversation anyways, right? To give them one, <laughs> one simple silver bullet. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it is, you know, uh, again, ah, it is. I feel that to have to create, I mean, first you have to create the awareness and then out of the awareness, there has to be some, the way that I described it to some folks when they're uh, specifically entrepreneurs that are trying to describe, you know, the direction where they're going the vision is you might have these awesome visions, but you need to give people some handles to hold on to because otherwise it's like fluffy cloud that you can't really explain and nobody really gets yes. you give them some handles and some concept that they understand in order to just have enough of a grasp and then eventually you can let it go. Yeah. But to get to the letting go, you have to go through the process and through the journey, which is which is pretty much what you've described. Because essentially, like, 
it's 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 the path to mastery. You get so good that it's internalized that it's not a process anymore. It's just yes. nature. Yeah. Yeah. That's the progression from learning to it's like um I used to teach dance and uh and I knew a lot of ravers because I was a raver back in the day when we even used that word. And uh so people that went to raves typically had just sort of they liked the music and they would move however they wanted. And that was kind of what it was accepted. And then they'd come to my classes and they get frustrated because I was teaching technique and they're like, I just want to move how I want to move. And it, it's totally fine. But part of what creates art is the restrictions a little bit like we have to first learn the steps so that then we can throw the steps out. We have to learn the rules so we can then learn how to bend the rules. And that's where mastery lies. Um, so um, you're a coach, yes? Yes. What kind of people do you kind of, what do you, what do, you do? What kind of people do you work with and where do people find you? Where I, where I found myself is working with innovative leaders. So out of everybody that I've worked so far, there's been an interesting thread and they're all innovative. They're glass ceiling breakers. They're usually mm -hmm. out front kind of on the vanguard. And sometimes it feels lonely because you're at the very front of the pack and there's no one really around you blazing a new trail. And I've right. had pretty much every single one of my clients describe themselves as a trailblazer. And so mm. specifically they are uh, either senior leaders or executives or entrepreneurs that are changing culture, that are changing things inside of an organization, or they're building this, some kind of a new thing, whether that is uh, uh, you know, an AI tech company that's that's working to solve how electricity is used instead of a bigger building, or yeah. whether that is uh, whether there is a real estate company that's changing the way that real estate is done in order to support local communities. Like those huh. are the kind of people that I'm really resonating with. And do they? Also, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Do, do they find them like I could imagine if you're out at, on the vanguard? This is the same word that came to my mind. I would imagine there might be often like. A, either a feeling of like having to fight through people pulling you back to the, you know, the known, the mainstream and, or this like fear, like, am I crazy? There are people like, is that a common theme for them? It happens. It doesn't happen all yeah. the time, but it, it is, it is, I would say it's one of the elements because you're, uh -huh. you're, you're kind of like, well, you know, one of the executives that I'm working with, she's changing the culture of this entire organization. And we had a conversation recently. She let someone go by breaking all the rules. Mm. And the way that things are done through HR and everything, she went about a completely different way because of one question that we asked. And we looked at how will this moment right now that you have to have with this person be the best thing that ever happened to her a year from now. Right. And that is not how that organization, it's a big organization. <laughs> That's not how they right. approach it. They usually sit you down with an HR manager and then you're like, here's your papers and all that kind of stuff. And it's done. But, and, 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 so she is uh, the type of person that that's changing things. Mm, and we talked about, right. so after that we debriefed and, and the last conversation was like, how do you roll that out to your peers and yeah. how do you then roll it out against the entire leadership team so that how you do this changes and the mm. reputation of your organization, and like it changes a whole bunch of different things, but that's just one instance. Huh, cool. And where, where do people find you? Um, the easiest place to find me is at ernestbarbaric.com. So my website, um, and I've been, I don't even know where I'm, I'm mostly active on LinkedIn as well. And I have a podcast too, that I just started uh, rebuilding again. I call cool. it Art of, Art of Meaningful Work. Art of Meaningful Work? Yeah. And, then the and that's on I iTunes? about my experience with, uh, with uh, psychedelics and, and psychics and stuff. So it was a... <laughs> It was an interesting one. That's a good a good <laughs> way to kick ideas. off, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah cool. I, it's been on hiatus for a year and a half, and there's a ton of interviews with all kinds of really interesting people on there as well. And so now I'm rebuilding it back up. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, saying yes to this. Um, let me just check and see if there's anything I want to say to finish up. Um, I'm just going to say today, if you'd like to be one of our uh, guests on this show, then send an email to pr at adamquiney.com, or you can message me directly on Facebook. I always love to have people volunteer. And uh, thanks everyone that came and hung out. Uh, Danielle, Mia, Deb, Sachko, Siwash, Lauren, Brenda, I think Leo was here, David. It's great to have you guys with us. And I hope everyone has an awesome weekend. Bye, guys. Yeah, thanks so much.